So, um, good evening. Ooh, it's very, it picks up really well. Um, good evening. Uh, I'm Josh Ginsberg. I'm the president of the Cary Institute. And it is a pleasure, as always, uh, to welcome you to Friday Night at the Cary. Uh, it's a foggy, rainy, yay, um, you know, evening. And so thank you all for uh, coming out doing that. Um, before I start, I will do my usual thanks to our Aldo Leopold Society members. Those people have little cards on the back of their seats. Uh, they are our friends and supporters, and uh, for the privilege of being an Aldo Leopold Society member, uh, you get many things, but one of the most important ones is a reserved seat at the Friday night series. So uh, if you're interested in knowing more about that, uh, either stop me or one of the staff, uh, go out on the table, pick up a brochure. Uh, we love the fact that you come, we love the fact that you support us, uh, and we love the fact uh, of your financial support as well. Um, I would like to talk about three upcoming events next Sunday. So this is sort of a, a bit of a mean thing to do. Um, Rick Hospital is doing a Lyme disease walk next Sunday. Um, no, we are not going to infect you with the chicks. Um, we're going to talk about them. It is full, however, there's a waiting list and there are only two people on it. When I heard it was only two people, I thought I would let you know. Um, so if you're interested, do sign up. Uh, we'll try and do this again uh, maybe in the spring. Um, On uh, Saturday, November 12th, we're doing one of our science and policy forums, science and management forums, excuse me, called Before the Lease, Farm Choices for Landowners. So in collaboration with the Columbia Land Conservancy and Duchess Land Conservancy um, uh, and the Farmer Land Management Program of the DLC, we're going to be talking uh, not just to people who have land that they want farmed, but for those people who do, please come. But we're going to be talking about opportunities and options for land management and farm management um, in the Hudson Valley. Uh, uh, CLC, the Columbia Land Conservancy, has done this before, and, and I have not attended, but I'm told it's a wonderful event. I will be there. I would love you to join us. Uh, on Friday, December 9th, we're having our next Friday night at the Cary, and depending on the weather, it may or may not be appropriate, uh, but sometime this winter, perhaps it will be. It's called Ice Storms and the Future of Northern Forests. Uh, Lindsay Rustad, who's with the Forest Service and was recently profiled in National Geographic and is a great speaker, will talk about it. Now, before I introduce our speaker, Karen Lips, I, I just want to wax poetic because there this really warm weather has sort of been bizarre. And I was coming up from Baltimore, it was 80 degrees and it was late October. But then I realized that NASA just announced the day before yesterday that no matter what happens, right, pretty much no matter what happens, 2016 is going to be the hottest year on record. Um, the extent of the Arctic ice shield in early September when it reached its minimum was the fifth smallest on record. Not the smallest, but the fifth smallest. You know, the historic floods of Hurricane Matthew, where Matthew came ashore with a, with a blast, and the North Shore picked up more speed because the ocean surface temperatures were so warm, and then blasted the Carolinas. Right, that was, um, you know, clearly you don't want to link any one of these events to climate change, um, human-driven climate change, but, but, but that's sort of uh, hard to, deny, uh, to ignore. Uh, Outside Magazine published uh, the first obituary I've ever seen in Outside Magazine for a place, and that was from the Great Barrier Reef, killed by climate change and ocean acidification. Um, for those of you who get the New Yorker or go online, Elizabeth Colbert, who's one of my favorite science writers, wrote a letter from Greenland uh, with the title, A Song of Ice, What Happens When a Country Starts to Melt? And finally, in Wednesday's presidential debate, uh, climate change got two whole seconds of reference, and in the three debates, five whole minutes of discussion. Right? So, you know, there's never been a time that's more important for scientists to focus on the communication of the importance of our work. And I am really pleased to introduce Karen Lips tonight she is a scientist who is dedicated uh, to communication of her science um, policy and outreach. And so it's appropriate that we have her here for Friday Night Series. Um, as a Stanford Alba Leopold Fellow, no relations to the Alba Leopold Society except for the fact that we all love Alba Leopold and want to honor him. Uh, she worked on these issues with a, a group of very distinguished scientists. Um, her day job is as an associate professor at the University of Maryland. Um, in the Graduate Program in Sustainable Development, which she directs. Um, her focus is on the ecology, conservation, and biology of amphibians, particularly frogs, so sort of following in 
Mary Green's footsteps, which Karen said isn't quite fair to anybody, and I'll agree with that. Um, we're having our second uh, amphibian talk. This one's going to focus more on conservation issues, I think, than Harris did. Um, you know, her work looks at the two major drivers of decline, global climate change, which is why I said all those things, uh, and uh, zoonotic disease, and the interaction between the two. You know, kindred fungus, which I'm sure you're going to talk about, or I can't see you not talking about it, um, is the pathogen that's, you know, the key pathogen responsible for amphibian decline. And, you know, for those of you who never experienced the keen serendipity that is field biology, I just want to relate to you how Karen discovered kindred fungus at our very remote uh, field site in the mountains of Costa Rica. So, in 1992, living in a 100 square foot, uh, unheated, uh, no electricity, no running water, hot, uh, parenthesis, this is what field biologists call heaven, right? Um, because it was at the top of a mountain in cloud forest in Costa Rica, um, Karen was studying uh, small green frogs, um, and iridescent tree frogs to be precise. You know, she lived there, um, uh, and then at Christmas in 1992, she went home. Which, of course, field biologists always have to go home. Sometimes they drag us out, kicking and screaming, but we go home. Um, and then she returned in 1993. She couldn't find any frogs. And, you know, initially she thought, oh, it's a dry season. They've gone, you know, up into the trees, down into the litter, somewhere else. Uh, and we were talking about a friend of mine, David Bigford, who about the same time had the same problem with Papa McGinney. Uh, but Karen persisted and discovered that the, the, the cause was more sinister. You know, and she'll talk about that, I'm sure, tonight. Um, I was, you know, I just love reading up on people's work and to do these introductions. And I really feel a kindred spirit with Karen because at one place, um, actually, Laurie Quill discovered that she was stalked by jaguars and pumas during her field work. And I thought, oh, gosh, that sounds so familiar. I was stalked by hyenas and leopards, right, because I was on a different continent. Um, fortunately, uh, the programs didn't get either of us, so we're both here tonight. And it's a pleasure to introduce Karen Hess. <laughs> Then we're, we're in pretty good shape. 
And this has been going on since the beginning of time. If you look for amphibians in, in ancient history, you can find the fire salamander in medieval texts from Europe. And there's all sorts of cool stories about them. Where I work in, in Latin America, there's a whole bunch of beautiful little gold amulets and ornamental uh, frogs, and, as well as snakes and, and crocodiles and other animals that are represented by, by the, the different indigenous groups there. Um, as symbols for fertility and the rain. And even in, in uh, New York City, uh, with our Puerto Rican uh, diaspora, um, the connection to frogs, the coqui, of course, um, has gone back in time to the indigenous cultures of Puerto Rico with the Taino. And this is one of their uh, a modern representation of a, an ancient culture's um, symbol for the, for the frog. So this just shows us that we have had connections to, obviously, not just frogs, but wildlife in general for a, a very long time. And, and that's going to be what's going to help us um, make these connections and make progress in, in conservation. So why should we care? You guys know better than probably anybody all the different reasons why. And I've just showed you a bunch of social and cultural values that we often sort of skim over. And instead, we tend to focus on the science ones. But you guys also, of course, know about these as well. Um, every year there's more and more emerging diseases, vector-borne diseases like Zika and dengue. Amphibians and, and animals in general are really important in, in minimizing the mosquitoes and the flies that carry those diseases. Amphibians, there's a lot of amazing biomedical and biotech work going on now, um, looking not just at the, the chemistry coming out of their skin, but also their ability to regenerate their entire limbs or tails, or in some cases, parts of their heart, as a way to perhaps help humans at, at some point. And again, here, you guys have so much history um, in ecosystem ecology that amphibians um, are a classic example of how important, very abundant, the very small little vertebrates can be to the ecosystem of a forest, the ponds, the lakes, and the rivers. So there's no end of reasons why we should care. Um, and the problem with the amphibians, of course, is that they are probably the most endangered group of, of certainly of vertebrates and probably of most uh, organisms right now on the planet. And part of this is, is data. Part of it is also current um, problems with these amphibians. So this is a map of the, sort of the, what we know about the distribution of the species of amphibians around the world. And you can pretty quickly see that the tropics is where it's at, right? Especially South America. 50% of all amphibians occur between the border with Mexico and Tierra del Fuego. And there's new ones being described every single year. As of today, we have 7,571 species of amphibians. And it changes every single day. So just remember, the tropics is where we have most diversity of amphibians. But even North America is not is doing pretty darn good in terms of lots of species. Well, it was 2004 when we really realized what, how bad the, the state of amphibians was. This is the first and it's been the, the only time that we've actually assessed the global status of amphibians on the planet. And this was the work of hundreds and hundreds of experts coming in and simply describing what they knew about all the different species of amphibians. And at that point, we realized that something like 40% of the species were showing evidence of declines around the globe. This was incredible. It's way more than birds. It's way more than mammals. And again, this was 10, 12 years ago now, and we don't really know how things have changed. My guess is it's probably even worse today than it was in 2004. And what was shocking is that there were several <clears throat> that had been considered presumably extinct, and all those were really recent, like in the past 20 or 30 years. So this was a huge global problem, and it was a recent problem. And it seemed to have occurred without anybody really noticing it. And that was what was really scary. Uh, I just picked four pictures that I have in my collection. These are the frogs that I used to work on in that shack when I was doing my PhD that disappeared um, during that year. I didn't work on the golden toad in Costa Rica, but uh, I worked on, this is my dissertation species here. I haven't seen it in 15 years, more, since 92. This is what, where it happened. And I'll show you that uh, 
you can see pretty easily that all the red here is where we're seeing these, these problems. So it's really concentrated here in Central America. And remember, that's probably because that's where most of the species are. Right? This is the concentration of species, lots of endemism. They're only found in very small areas. So it's pretty easy to have a huge impact when there's so many species crammed into a small amount of area. Let's take a blow-up look at that part of the world and you really see the problem. Right? Look at how many species are missing from this part of the world, including the Caribbean. Right? We're talking dozens and dozens and dozens of species that just disappeared in my lifetime. Not even in like 20 years. All this happened between 1970 and the current time. What caused it? We'll talk a lot about chytrid fungus. These are sort of what we always look, think about when we think about sort of the historic problems with conservation of most animals. Um, the, the traditional ones, we have a hard enough time dealing with the ones that we think where we know what the cause is and we still can't seem to overcome overexploitation, the rhinos, the elephants of the world. But today, we're really struggling with these down here. Um, and I've put little asterisks ne next to invasive species and emerging infectious disease because the story of amphibians and the chytrid fungus is a story of both of these things. Where I worked in Central America, the fungus is an invasive species and it's an emerging infectious disease. So we have, to some degree, two big problems, neither one of which we have a good handle on how to address it, what we can do uh, from that. This is a, a paper that just came out. You realize that a lot of this information is brand new. This, the field is changing every single day, it seems like. This paper came out earlier this year, and it showed that BD, which is only described in 1997, is the worst invasive species in terms of its impact on vertebrate species. Right? So when we think of invasives, I know I often think about rats and cats being terrible. They're only number two and three on this list. And we got dogs, pigs, goats, and, and cattle down here. And so all these things, the cats and the rats of the world, they affect amphibians, reptiles, mammals, and birds. They affect all sorts of vertebrates. BD, the chytrid here, only affects amphibians, and it still blows the rest of them out of the water in terms of its impact. So that gives you an idea of how much devastation this one fungus has caused in such a short period of time. So where is this thing? The answer is basically everywhere. This is a, a map where it shows in these orange dots where we have found the chytrid. And there are still some gaps in the map where people haven't actually looked. There's some deserts where it probably doesn't live. But there's places like the Amazon Basin, which haven't been well studied at all. Um, but we can basically see where we've looked, we have found it. And we now know, just in the past couple of years, that it's not just one thing. This is a really important point. I've added onto the map names of these other types of chytrid. They're all BD, so I'm going to call them chytrids, BD with little air quotes, because it turns out that there's a lot of genetic variation in BD. And so just in the past couple of years, we found this endemic species here in the Brazilian rainforest. It's, it's a type of BD, but it's different genetically that it's probably a different species. Same thing in South Africa, same thing in Korea, there's another one in Switzerland. There's this new thing that's a whole different species that affects salamanders that I'll talk about a little bit later. So the point is here is that there's more than one species. They vary genetically. They vary in terms of their impact on amphibians. And there's probably a lot more of them out there that we have not yet found. They're not found, not all of them are, occur everywhere. And I'll show you that in a second. And so that means we have to be careful not to move these other things into the US or to other places as well. The problem with BD and these chytrids is that the number of species that they can infect is huge. Right now, we're somewhere at 700 species of amphibians can be infected. It's probably most of them. They just haven't been tested yet. So that tells us then that all amphibians can be a vector. They can be a reservoir. They can be a host um, and help spread it to others. And that's what makes this so difficult to figure out, what are we going to do about this? Because you can't just focus on one species. You have to think about all of them and the environment. But parts of these are definitely invaded areas from invasive chytrids. I just want to briefly show you this, um, just to remind you that here's these endemic lineages in the middle.
here's the new salamander chytrid. I'm going to talk a lot about these things at the top, just to show you that we call it the global pandemic lineage. This is the one that we know for sure is an invasive species, that it has been moved around somehow and continues to be spread. These things, we believe, are endemic to those areas, but there's still very much we don't know about them. This is a, a, a map that gives you an idea of what we know about what's, where they are in the Americas. So we have three colors here. Here's the green Brazilian endemic species, only found in Brazil. And up here in North America, we see mostly blue. And that's one of the genetic variants of this global invasive species form. In South America, we see it's mostly red. And so that's the other genetic form in South America. But notice that there's a green box here. There's some red boxes here. We got some blue down here. The squares represent captive animals. And this is another really important point. Because what we see is that it looks like the wild animals, the circles up here, are all the blue type. But the squares are both red and green as well. And that's telling us that new strains are moving in through our, our trade, through the pet trade, through the food trade, you know, probably through a variety of, of means. And in Brazil as well, we have some red boxes down here. right? So again, captive animals coming in with infections from other places. So this is the this is a the or one of the big problems with this with this um, uh, issue is that things are moving around and there's still things that aren't here in the U.S. that we want to keep out. Um, a little bit more detail on what's going on in the Americas because this is the place in the world we have the best data. We've sampled North America and South America the best of anywhere. Look at North America. I guarantee you go out anywhere in North America and you pick up enough frogs and test them, you will find feeding infected animals. It probably won't take very long at all. So that's something to, to realize because when you think about North America, I think we know about the problems going on in the Sierra Nevadas in California. Um, but we don't hear about declines or die-offs or extinctions of amphibians in the eastern half of the U.S. or the Midwest. But BD is there. And that's part of the story that has really yet to be investigated is what what happened here? What is happening here? What will happen here? And there's uh, quite a bit more to be done here. Um, and I'll just briefly say that the impacts on amphibians for most of these areas has not been done. There's very little population studies of amphibians with chytrid present in terms of what it's doing. So just to sort of give you a general summary, chytrids are everywhere. There's a lot more of them than we ever thought. Um, they infect most amphibians, or many, many species of amphibians. Um, and the impacts vary a lot. And now I'll talk a little bit more about how different species respond, how different communities respond to when BD is present in the system. The big problem is that it persists in the environment somehow. And all you need is a couple of frogs present to keep it there, which means that the solutions to helping the frogs are really, really difficult to think about what they might be. Because how do you treat wild animals? It's treatable in captivity pretty easily. There's a variety of, of chemical treatments, temperature treatments that you can do. But right now, the only thing we can think about for effective conservation is to keep it out as long as you can. Um, once it gets there, it becomes a problem because we don't know what to do. This is sort of what happens when BD arrives into a naive population. Uh, these are two sick frogs. This one's dead. This one's dying. Skin is sloughing off. And it, it, it affects the skin is, is sort of the main root. And really the main point here is that the more infection you have, the greater the chance that the, an individual frog or salamander will die of infection. The more animals in a population that have a really high infection, the greater the chance that, that population is going to blink out of existence. And the same is true for a species. If you have a really small species and most of them are a big infection, there's a good chance that you could see extinction in that particular case. And that's really sort of then what my lab's been working on. Is, well, I'm a frog biologist. I started out just counting frogs up in the mountains of Costa Rica, and it was by pure random bad luck, I guess, that I found dead frogs. And since then, it's been trying to figure out, well, why did these guys go extinct? How did these guys survive? And these guys didn't seem to be affected at all. 
And today, this figure that I've shown now for many years changes all the time. And I'll show you the modern version in a second. But the, the, the connection between the amphibians, and all these things matter, the ecology of the amphibians, the habitat it occupies, its immune system, its genetics, the number of them out there, all those things can affect the outcome of infection. But so can the pathogen contribute to that as well. What kind is it? Is it version one? Is it genetic version two? Is it an endemic version? How long has it been there? Is it a recent arrival? Is it been there for a hundred some years? That's something that not too many people have investigated either. And then of course the environment can also modulate this, this interaction as well. Certain conditions help the fungus live longer and cause greater problems. But it's that interaction that determines to some degree the intensity of the infection and the number of spores then is a, sort of the best estimate we have of whether or not an animal will die. Some species are able to keep it at low levels and they can live with an infection. This is sort of what I'm thinking about now in terms of where are we going next because we've learned so much about the system that now we know that it's not just a species. You have to think about all the different species in a community. And communities with different combinations of species are going to respond differently to infection than others will. And now that we have so many different types of, of chytrid, we have communities of pathogens as well. So you can imagine a situation where you have many species of frogs, many species of pathogens, all infecting at the same time. How is that going to affect the outcome? So things have suddenly become even more complicated. If you imagine this is sort of a three-dimensional version of the previous image, you sort of can get a feel for how much more complicated uh, the situation is now than it was 30 years ago when we first found this thing. So I'm going to give you a, a real short overview of three examples just from my lab that show you this incredible range of responses of amphibians to chytrids. And the first one is sort of, I think, what at least I expected to see all over the globe once we discovered this, this, this disease. Um, this is sort of, again, where I began. Here's Costa Rica, very mountainous. Here's Panama, S-shaped, and Colombia's down here. And this is sort of the, the epidemic phase where we, we, this is the one part of the world where we're pretty sure, based on lots of, of sampling, that it was negative for BD. You know, we, we tested lots and lots of animals over many years, and it wasn't present. And we were able to watch the situation change when BD arrived. So this is a case where we we're pretty sure it was invasive. And the, the story kind of starts way back in the days of the golden toad in, in Monteverde. And no, there's still no definitive cause for that decline, but I think the weight of the evidence suggests that it was chytrid fungus that probably was the cause. This is where I was working for my PhD, down here right on the border between Costa Rica and Panama, my little shack. And again, one day I came back and the frogs were all gone. And it's in a biosphere reserve, so it's not like the trees are being chopped down, there's no factories, it's in the middle of nowhere, just the jaguars and the uh, uh, mountain lions. And so when the frogs disappeared there, I had to keep moving east. And so I moved into western Panama, very similar habitat, and a couple years later, found 50 dead frogs over a Christmas break. And it was the sheer number of animals that we had to be able to send to a veterinarian that allowed us to figure out what was going on. And when we did that, it turned out that the Australians had dead frogs with the same thing. The National Zoo had dead frogs there as well. That was sort of our ability then to figure out what, what actually happened. But the story continued and, you know, we sort of moved further east in Panama. And it's this site here that I'm going to talk a little bit more about. Because that was a site we were there for eight years and we waited and waited. And in those eight years, my grad students and I counted thousands and thousands of frogs and snakes and lizards. And really came to understand the diversity of, of frogs at this site and watched it as it happened when chytrid arrived. But it was this sort of stakeout that allowed us to draw this line and actually say, this is an epidemic wave. 
and was sort of the best evidence that this thing was an invasive species. And it's continued, and in fact, all of Panama is infected, all of Central America is infected, and South America actually was infected much earlier, and we just completely missed it. So this is, uh, uh, again, a little synopsis of what happened at that site when we watched Kittred arrive after eight years. This is just a range of some of the most beautiful frogs that, that were there. There used to be 74 species, at least, and that was just one river valley. We didn't even do the entire park. Today there's 40, uh, the rest of them have disappeared and we haven't seen them again. Some may be extinct. Here in the entire state of New York, there are 33 species of amphibians to give you an idea of differences in biodiversity. And this is sort of what happened. This is our stakeout. So here at the bottom, we started going there every summer. That's how I spent my summers for many years, counting frogs. And this is the number of animals we caught. And you just see that over time, you know, we're getting pretty good at counting frogs and things are really good. And then as soon as we get the first positive test for BD, the numbers just crash. And that's exactly when we started finding dead frogs. And there was just dozens of dead frogs littering the ground every time we went out. And after five months, there really weren't very many frogs left at all. And it took many years for them to really continue to, to decline. There's still no recovery at this site. Um, some species are completely missing, some persist. Nothing's really at the levels they used to be at. Um, they kind of fluctuate a little bit, but um, things, are, things are not normal there. And it was only because we had been there that we could say with confidence that things really changed and changed in a big way. This is sort of, if we look at the different species, I've just sort of put them in different bins here. Um, over here on the far right, we have all the species that were completely lost. Those 30 some species that used to be there that we haven't seen. They include the golden frog of, of Panama, as well as a gastrotheca, a really cool canopy frog. These we haven't seen in many, many years. On the other hand, there are frogs like the, the red-eyed tree frog from all those posters. They seem to be doing fine. So are Bufa marinus, an invasive species in many parts of the world. And these guys both have really big population sizes, they're very broadly distributed, and that probably helps them persist, um, even with um, uh, a lethal fungus out there. The rest of them, including our little glass frog and this little terrestrial guy, they've declined a lot. So they've declined by more than 50%, but they persist. Some are in the forest, some are in the streams. Um, they don't really seem to recover. But it gives you an idea that species really showed a wide range of, of responses. And we're still trying to figure out exactly, you know, what the, the key differences are. Um, just to show you sort of some of the disease <coughs> responses for this site, um, each column is all the different swabs that we took of the frogs. That's how we figure out if they're infected or not. We, we rub them with a Q-tip, we send it to the lab, and then we can count the number of, of spores on it, which is an estimate of how badly they're infected. And so before BD showed up, all the frogs that we swabbed were negative, okay? As soon as BD appeared, we see that 80% of the frogs were infected, and the ones in the red had really, really, really high levels. So these are the ones that were sick, dead, or dying. And over time, from 2004 to 2010 over here, we see that the number of infected animals has gone down. But even here, there's still quite a number of frogs that are infected, and a bunch of them are still at the really high levels. Suggesting that even though we don't hardly ever find a dead frog anymore, it's probably what they do die when they go back to their um, retreat sites at, in the morning. So over time, we see that there was this, here's our epidemic wave right here. This is sort of the average infection. As soon as it shows up, there's this huge peak, and it's been declining ever since. Today we go out, and almost everything is infected but at really, really, really low levels. Are they surviving with it? Are they dying when we don't see them? Again, we still need a lot more population um, uh, follows to, to figure out what's actually happening there. Uh, here's sort of three different species, just to give you a flavor, because that was like everybody in the community there. Here's three different species. Again, here's our, our same setup, but here's the infection level. And here's the abundance level for this guy, for our glass frog, and for our terrestrial, terrestrial frog. And we see three really different patterns. This guy, everybody was infected instantly. 98% were infected at really, really high levels. 
It was as if they instantly all became heavily infected when BD first showed up. And not surprisingly, they, are dis they have disappeared, and we don't see them anymore. This guy, not everybody was infected initially. Eventually, they all did, but at really low levels. And they're the ones that seem to be doing the best at this site, even though they live in the same streams as this guy. So it's not just a habitat thing. This guy lives in the forest, he never goes into the streams, and you can see that he's somewhere in the middle. Really high levels, big declines, but they persist as well. So there's so much variation among the different species in their response that you can't really predict how anything might respond to infection. But we're really interested in understanding this, especially for these guys, these golden frogs of Panama, where they've been eliminated from most of Central and South America, but they're the one species that the zoos have been able to get to breed. And so if you go to a zoo or an aquarium, you've probably seen them there. And the goal is to put them back out there. But these guys are the ones that, remember, went extinct and are super susceptible. They pick up an infection and they start shedding millions and millions of zoospores. And so we're trying to work with the zoos to try and figure out, is it even safe to put them back out there? Because remember, the fungus doesn't go away. It is there in the environment somewhere. If you put a new frog out there, it will probably eventually pick that fungus up and start growing it and could cause uh, secondary problems. So we're trying to figure out, would that happen and uh, what, what we can do to, to minimize that risk. So Panama, sort of, I think what we expected to see is that once we understood what the problem was, we could go out in the world and wait for it to show up somewhere else, and we would see that another epidemic here and another one over there. But interestingly, it turns out that after all these years, we've only really seen about four areas that have suffered epidemics. Panama, California, Spain, and we caught the tail end of it in Australia. And so, if you think back to the map, BD is everywhere. Why didn't we see epidemics everywhere else? I think part of the answer might be in what's going on in the Midwest of the United States. And so we, uh, working with my, my grad student here, Brooke Talley, uh, we had a state wildlife grant, and she went out and surveyed the state of Illinois. Seems like a random place. That's where I was working before. We knew that Kittred was present. We knew that there had been some mysterious declines in the past, but beyond that, it wasn't clear what the status was. And uh, the, the DNR was really interested in knowing what to do with Kittred. Was it there? Where was it? How to prevent the spread? So Brooke went out and she swabbed thousands of frogs over these two years, surveyed all these different ponds, something like almost 100 different types of wetlands. And what she found is that Illinois is a BD hotspot. I think anybody would have ever predicted that, much less myself. But everywhere she went, she found infected animals. Every pond was infected, every species was infected. 50% um, of all the individuals she sampled were infected. And yet, she never found a dead frog that was infected with, with high levels of, of chytrid. So they're heavily infected, they have really high levels, but they're not dying of it. How is that possible? Here's just the, to show you how badly the infections were, remember, this is sort of a line of 10,000 zoospores. Remember I said the really high intensities is really bad. In California, this is sort of the level where you start to see really high mortality in the, the, the random frogs out, out there. And for all these Illinois frogs, we see that many of them, there's individuals above that line. So at least some individuals have really, really high levels of infection, but they're not dying of it. How is that possible? Well, it turns out that when Brooke went to the museum specimens and she swabbed them to see what was the earliest record of BD in the, in the state to figure out, you know, was there an epidemic? Did we miss it? When might this have happened? It turned out she could not go far enough back. The museum specimens only went back to the 1880s, and there were infected animals in the 1880s. Right now, this is the oldest official record of BD in amphibians, Illinois. Who would have guessed Illinois? I don't personally think this is the oldest record. It's just the oldest one we have right now. Um, but it's been present for over 140 years, infecting frogs. Is that the reason why we're not seeing die-offs? Is it that this particular type of BD, we don't actually have a culture of it, is it some endemic lineage to North America that maybe is not as strong as the one that, that moved through Panama? Maybe it's a, another one. 
We don't know. Uh, we don't actually know what it's doing to the populations of frogs. Um, there haven't been very many studies, and we have not followed up and done any market capture to know, are the current frogs that are infected, are they even uh, surviving, are they dying? Um, there's still a ton of work yet to be done, even in our own backyard here. So again, this is like just changing what our perception of BD was. Yes, it's invasive in some areas. Yes, it causes epidemics in, in some places. But in other places, it's been there a really long time. And it does not seem to be causing problems now. But what did it do way back when? We still don't know. So the whole story of, of hatred is really becoming much more complex and confusing than, than we thought. So Illinois, lots, lots of interesting stuff to be done and um, might explain why we haven't seen very much die-offs here in the eastern U.S. So my third short story is that of salamanders and of the Appalachians. And it's, it's a really interesting story as well and very different from the last two. And it's really important because in North America, we are the world's biodiversity hotspot for salamander species. Remember when I showed you where amphibian biodiversity was in the U.S., the eastern U.S. is pretty high? It's because of salamanders, right? Salamanders, unlike frogs, which are pretty globally distributed, salamanders are northern hemisphere species, uh, taxonomic group. And it's North America in particular where they really diversify. They barely squeaked into South America through the, the Panamanian Isthmus, but we have more species than anybody else. And this is a big concern because, as I mentioned, there's that new chytrid of, of salamander out there that will obviously be, be devastating should it get to North America. Well, so when I moved to Maryland eight years ago, I was lucky in that Dr. Richard Hyten was an emeritus professor there. And he had spent his entire life studying plepidonic salamanders in the entire eastern U.S. He was a taxonomist. He's interested in life history surveys. These are his sites here. This is from a, a paper he published where he described the population biology of a couple hundred different populations of different species of, of these salamanders. And what he said in 2005 in his book chapter is that every place with an S had suffered huge declines in abundances. No species had gone extinct, but across the eastern U.S., unknown to almost anybody except for Richard Hyden, Salamanders had declined precipitously in the 1970s. So by 1980, he realized something had happened, even though he'd been out there since the 1950s. And you can see it's pretty much everywhere, right? Here in New York, all the way out here in Arkansas, Florida, you name it. These are most of the sites here in the Appalachians, because that's where all the diversity is. And that's where we decided to follow up on his study, and we did a resurvey here and figuring well, we know BD is present in North America. I, we could go out. He put all his specimens in the Smithsonian Museum, five miles down the road. We can go in and swab them in the museum. We can swab them in the field. And we can try and figure out at what point BD entered the system and figure out was it associated with the declines in the 1970s. And in fact, just like he said, we had a hard time finding the species that should have been at all those different sites where he said they used to be found fairly commonly. And it also varies among the different species groups. This group here, the slimy salamanders, they're, they're a little tough to find out, even, even the best of days with the best herpetologists. And they seem to be affected at the greatest level. But because they're tough, there's a little bit more, um, less certainty about how accurate our searches are. But I think you guys know how abundant the redback salamander is. And it was missing from a quarter of the sites we were surveyed. The redback salamander, the thing that lives under every log, every rock in the forest, put out a team of herpetologists for a couple hours in a site and can't find a redback salamander where they're typically found. I think that tells you more than, than the slimy salamander. So clearly something is going on out there. Uh, our data totally confirmed what Dr. Heighton had found. And when we reanalyzed all his data, what we saw is that in the first three decades of his work, 1950 through 1980, this was sort of the occupancy across all the different sites. And in the 1970s, something happened, and there's a downward shift. There was an overall loss, a reduction, in the occupancy of salamanders in those sites. 
So something is happening out there. I thought for sure if we went there, we'd be able to sort of point our finger at BD and figure it all out. So like I said, we, we had all these museum specimens at the, at the Smithsonian, and we, we did a bunch of, of tests and ran swabs in something like 1,400 animals from across that whole transect across the Appalachians here. And we found BD, but only four at the same site on the same day. So that wasn't very interesting. But think about Illinois. Illinois is just right over here, and 50% of all animals are heavily infected. And that's newts, it's salamanders, it's frogs, you name it. These things, nothing's infected. Nothing is infected. Even though there's ponds filled with infected frogs nearby. What is it about this particular group of salamanders that has allowed them to persist in an area where BD is widespread in the environment. We don't know the answer to that. Again, we don't actually have a culture from that particular part of the world. Um, it could be that maybe it's not a very viable um, picture out there. It could be that these little guys have, like the frogs in Illinois, experienced this for so many decades, they've come up with a way to minimize and maybe even eliminate so here it is, where we have three really different stories, all done by the same lab in a relatively short period of time. Panama, we have epidemics when an uh, invasive species enters a naive community. In Illinois, we don't know what's going on, but clearly we have a really old infection in a, in a community for which it doesn't seem to be having negative impacts. And then we have Appalachia. Lots of negative impacts on the populations, but what's the cause? Is there an endemic form of a chytrid out there? We don't know. And so again, right in our own backyard, there are still really major questions that have yet to be answered. And so the story of the salamanders then brings me to my final bit of this story, and that is, can we learn anything from what we saw with DD and do our best to prevent problems as these new emerging infectious diseases pop up? And in particular, I'm going to focus a little bit on the salamander chytrid because it's actually a hopeful story um, in terms of making progress and building off past failures. So in 2014, Anna Martel and Frank Hopkins and a group of, of, of researchers described a new species of salamander, chytrid, this thing that we're going to call B. sal. And it was infecting these spider salamanders in Europe, and they became infected because of trade from Asia of, of wild newts were apparently infected with this new fungus that somehow escaped into the wild in Europe and is now in, infecting animals in the wild in Europe. It is now spreading in Europe. It started in the Netherlands. It's now in parts of Germany. And um, it's sort of going out in, from there. And they were able to show that looking at um, live animals in the trade and at museum specimens from the field in Asia, that b -cell, it was in the trade. Uh, infected newts were being shipped all around, the, uh, all around the world out of Asia. And so this was a huge red flag because even just a year ago, here in the U.S., we imported on average something like 4 million amphibians a year. Many of them are, are frozen frog legs for the food industry, but many of them are pets, both frogs and salamanders. A year, four million a year, and this has been going on for decades. So imagine how many infected animals we've been importing. And it's all totally legal, there's no, it was all totally legal, now it's no longer legal. Um, but once BD appeared on the scene, Many herpetologists and scientists really tried to find a way to prevent the import of other amphibians into the U.S. But because BD was already present in the U.S., it wasn't clear exactly what we could do. But with B. sal, we know that it's not present here in the U.S. We know that we have the world's greatest number of salamander species anywhere. And so the threat and the risk are really high. And so we started working. Many, many people started talking with Fish and Wildlife to try and come up with a solution to how can we stop the trade in at least the salamanders and prevent them from coming into the U.S. Because we looked at this as only a matter of time before an infected salamander came in. 
And they normally use the Lacey Act. And the Lacey Act is great for when it was designed 100 some years ago to prevent the invasion of things like fish or mammals or rats. But it's not designed for diseases or pathogens. So there's no way you could just say, keep BD out, keep BSAL out. We're going to prevent the import of, B of these diseases. It can only be the host. So in an amazing turn of events, uh, Fish and Wildlife in January actually banned the import of 200 species of salamanders. The 200 species that Frank and Ann had shown to be infected with BSAL. And they said this goes into effect immediately so that nobody can bring in more newts that might be infected with the cell. The final rule has yet to come out. It will be coming out sometime soon. They continue to work on it. But the, it was a clear risk um, to our native biodiversity. There was a clear solution. The only solution that they could see was to keep these things out. So right now, you cannot actually import these 200 species of salamanders. And if others are shown to be susceptible, they'll add them to the list as well. So the good news is that given our bad history with BD, the community was able to mobilize, coordinate, and this was an international collaboration, working with the Europeans, working with all the different agencies. There was a lot of meetings, and Fish and Wild was very responsive and was able to move for them very quickly in about just over a year. And what's interesting is that now the U.S. is acting in a, a leadership role, and the Europeans who initially described this thing and discovered it are using the actions by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to go back to the European countries and try and pressure them to put in bans over there as well. So currently, we're the only ones with the bans, but um, the hope is that we will sort of globally revisit our trade laws to prevent trade not just in salamanders and kindred infected amphibians, but perhaps things like bats, snakes, or the sea stars, all of which are terribly suffering now from all these new and emerging infectious diseases. So while I've talked about amphibians all night, you know, this is really just one example of something that's been going on um, all around the world, plants and animals alike, with these terrible pathogens that are being spread around and we don't actually have any way legally to prevent their introduction. And this is where I'm super happy to be here in New York because you guys are the leaders in this right now. For the last two years, Senator Gillibrand has introduced to the Senate a, a bill changes to the Lacey Act that would allow more abilities to prevent the introduction of invasive pathogens called the Invasive Fish and Wildlife Prevention Act. This is the second year. Um, I doubt anything's going to happen in the next three weeks. But because she's done it two years in a row, and this past year, um, Representative Slaughter um, introduced the same bill into the House, um, that I'm going to guess that she'll probably do it again next year after the elections. And so this is where you guys, as New York State residents, could actually do something and support this by calling your representatives, because they are already on board on this. This is the greatest news of all, and I've never been able to end this talk with such positive actions that you guys could actually take. And so I'm going to end here, going back to Kermit, as a reminder that, you know, coming and giving a talk, it's always great to talk about the frogs, but I really hope in this case that this information has been able to empower you guys to do something to help save amphibians. Thank you very much. survived 
differ genetically from those that um, have not, but you can test them from captive animals. And there is natural variation, apparently, among species and populations in ability to fight off some of these chytrids. Um, and then apparently in other places, and perhaps it's, that's what's going on in places like Illinois, where they are evolved, they have evolved some sort of resistance. But this is like some of the newest stuff, and I think that's where we're going to sort of see a lot of information in the next couple of years. What, so are you asking something like, if all those amphibians disappear, what is the effect on the ecosystem? But what is their goal in the world? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so frogs and amphibians in general are incredibly important. And so like the Hubbard Brook experiment that was done just up the road from here is sort of the best example of how important amphibians are. And they actually looked at those little red bat sound landers there. And what they found is something like the, the sheer numbers, because they're so small, but there are so many of them, is the biomass is incredible. And so because they're so small, they're also feeding on much smaller things than say the birds and the mammals would. So they're hitting a very different set of insects than, than the birds and mammals. And thirdly, because they're cold-blooded, they don't waste all that energy that they eat as heat, burning it up as metabolism like we do. Instead, all that food they eat gets converted into salamanders or frogs. And so they, that, for those reasons, they're really important in cycling energy and nutrients, not only in the forest, but between the forest and the, the aquatic habitats. Because right, many of these things go and they breed in the ponds or the rivers or the creeks, and the larvae live there, and then they leave those habitats, bringing with them all that biomass that they just got out of the stream or the pond, and bring it back into the forest. So they connect habitats, both terrestrial and aquatic, upstream and downstream, and there's been a couple of, of, of pretty thorough studies. Uh, we had a whole team of stream ecologists working in Panama to study before and after what happened. So they're like little team recycling plants. That's a great phrase right there, yeah. And so when they disappeared in the gold in that Yeah, and so when they disappeared in Panama, everything changed. We saw snakes move away, we saw snakes start starving to death because they feed them frogs. We saw the streams change, the insects that live in there change, the algae started growing everywhere. Algae in streams is one of the ways that I sort of figure out, oh, how are the tadpoles here? Because when it gets slimy, it's usually a sign there's no tadpoles eating the, eating the algae. So, so they're very, very important. Yeah. So have, have these kitchens, you know, really been in the environment forever, and there's something that, that has changed in the environment that has made them now pathologic to species that towards which they previously were not pathologic? And is, is that so? What is it? That's a great question. I don't think we know that because the right we know that some of these things are invasive species. The question then is, is well, where did they come from? And wherever they came from, were they pathogenic to those animals there? And that's what, really what we still don't know. It took almost 20 years for the geneticists to be able to actually crack the genetic code to actually sequence it. So that I didn't even show you the phylogenetic tree because fungi have really complex DNA. Um, uh, all their genetics are kind of a mess. Um, and so it took a long time for them to even be able to see any pattern at all. And all that's really new. And so there's still figuring out like what is at the base of that tree, what, where did things come from, both geographically and evolutionarily. So I don't know the answer to your question. I'm sorry. In doing field work, uh, how do you avoid the uh, spreading of Well, um, there's now, there's been a protocol for the herpetologists who work on this. Um, and so people who go in the field, when we, you move from site to site, you bleach everything. You bleach your boots, you bleach the nets or leave the nets there, you 
wash the tires of your truck. Um, unfortunately, this probably isn't done by ecotourists or cattle or jaguars or things like that. So we do what we can to minimize it, but it's clear from like even that movement in Central America that um, there weren't like herpetologists going to these remote sites. I mean, it got there on its own. So it can move on its own. Yeah, we still don't know how that happens either. Um, whether it's being blown around on leaves or just really just the frogs or bugs or birds. People have been looking for a long time trying to figure it out and there's still no clear answer there either. Is there something that we could learn from, you know, the white nose syndrome and also the new situation in Europe? Uh, we know that it was human activity that introduced this fungus from Europe to North America. Okay, we've got that, but that is wrong, okay? But is there something in the uh, creatures in Europe that could be studied that they have some kind of resistance to that fungus over there that could be studied to help the creatures over here to become resistant as well, whether they were salamanders, bats, or whatever. In other words, you know, we develop a resistance to whatever it is that antibiotics or whatever we're given to diseases. And is there a way of, of teaching them ecosystem-wide to develop resistance? Yeah, that's a... What could these horrible funguses? Right, that's a great question, and that's essentially what lots of people are doing in many different angles. It's, it, I think the vets call it, or the epidemiologists call it case and control. Like, you know, these guys are infected, so how are they acting, and these guys are not. Um, and then you can go to places where there are survivors and try and figure out how do the survivors differ from what was there before the problem. And so that kind of depends on having samples. So there's very few samples for most parts of the world, whether it's museum specimens or tissues, really hard to find tissues even harder than museum specimens. But, but yeah, people are looking, and they're looking in many different ways, and that's sort of the idea is, is it the genetics? Is it the peptides? Is it the skin chemistry? Is it the ecology? Is it, and the problem is it's probably everything varies to some degree, but whether any one thing is the answer or not, is, it's probably going to be a, a mixture. Mm -hmm. the, so, I, I would say, if anything, we well, can predict that in the future, because we're going very quickly now with epidemiology, that they might be able to develop a, a, a you know a way of getting a resistance to help the salamanders and the bats and everybody. Uh, you to, know, to resist the history. There's there's lots of people studying, especially like the microbes. You know, they they can do all sorts of great lab experiments and say, okay, these microbes kill BD in culture. And then they can either add it to an amphibian or give them a boost of it or something like that. And it, some of these experiments have been positive, at least in the short term. Others have been negative in the short term. There's no long-term studies, so we don't know how well it's going to work. And the big problem, the big test, is doing it in nature. You know, you can do something in the lab and everything works perfect. But getting this thing to work in the field, they've had, that's where they've run into problems. Things work for about two years, and then it's years three and four where things kind of tend to fall apart. So maybe people are trying. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Any other questions? No, so with the amphibians, when people collect them and put them in a museum, they usually fix them in formalin and then they put them in alcohol. So all the spores are dead. But because BD lives in the skin, it, they're not actually on the skin. And so probably what we're doing when we rub the preserved animal is we're picking up those spores coming out of the skin. Um, so they're not viable at all. So the life cycle of that fungus, is, is there a condition that has to exist? Yeah, they know the life cycle. I didn't go over here, but what it does is the, if you imagine like a little sperm or a tadpole looking thing, that's the, the zoospore. And so it swims like a little tadpole in water, moisture, and it burrows into the skin of an amphibian. And when it burrows in, it drops its tail and it transforms into this sort of round circular thing. 
called a zoosporangia, and inside then it produces more zoospores. And then when they're mature, the thing opens up and spits out new zoospores, some of which will reinfect the animal, others will swim away and infect another one. So that part is, is fairly well known. Yeah, they can do that in the lab. Two more questions. Could possibly one uh, factor to uh, help explain the differential death rates when we, we see the different <coughs> uh, frogs that we're seeing exposed to the same pivot possibly have to do with the uh, different types of uh, uh, herbicides and uh, insecticides that are used in, in <coughs> different regions. I'm thinking, I, I, I really appreciate your take on this. Possibly in Central and South America, where environmental regulations are a lot looser than government regulatory agencies who are more corrupt, uh, could, could it be that some of the chemicals banned in the U.S. are simply <coughs> shipped, uh, say, down to Panama or Ecuador and so forth? What, what do you think? Um, certainly, chemical use varies all over the globe. Um, certainly, the chemicals could have an impact on amphibians, but also the chytrid. Um, there's been some work actually in the Midwestern U.S. where chemicals actually kill the chytrid, because they're chemicals. And the toxicologists actually analyzed all these sites between the good sites and the bad sites. And you know what? There's lots of chemicals, and they all vary in many different ways, but if you know anything about trying to assign cause to a toxin, it's almost impossible. Um, especially in places where you don't really know how long a chemical lasts in a particular environment, like the tropics, which is very different than here. If you've ever read about the EPA, they test things in many different ways, and it's not always consistent. And it's very difficult to point at something and say, that could have done something, is the problem. Last question. Uh, in the case of fog, that in order to affect uh, the environment, we do wax, because the fog is wax. Are they going to affect it, or how is it going to be reacted to that? Is that like the monkey, the monkey frog, which I think is a, it's like a red-eyed tree frog a little bit in like Peru. Yeah, I don't know the status of that particular one um, at all. There was something in the back. One last question back there. Yeah. Um, so, in the frogs that have a high amount of the infection, do you think that like, the genetic question you deal with is related to that patient because of their response? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, the frogs, the really high infection might be the genetics of them that helps them um, fight it off. Yeah, there's been some work that um, people can show that certain species or certain individuals, for whatever reason, have a particular immune system or particular genes that seem to be associated with survival instead of their friends who don't have it that, that die. So yeah, great question, and I think there's going to be a lot more of that coming up in the future. Thank you. Lights remind me we're, we're trying to do some fundraising to upgrade the lighting and the sound. <laughs> if anybody's interested, talk to me. Otherwise, uh, enjoy your weekend and uh, stay away. <laughs> <laughs>